Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Mosaic Podcast. Today, it is my honor and my privilege and my treat to bring to you a friend of mine from a lot of years ago. He's someone that I've known over the course of many, many years, and I don't get to talk to him enough, and I don't get to see him enough. I met him when he was the security person for at the Montel Williams show when I traveled there for Hay House with Sylvia Brown. And there was something that lurked behind him that I always saw in his eyes. He's a beautiful, beautiful man. He's an author now, a patented, a patented inventor, a former dedicated law enforcement officer and a security consultant to not only Montel, but many high profile celebrities and corporate executives. His focus forward mindset has translated his dreams into a reality. And now he's sharing his easy, common sense steps that help them overcome the odds to find personal and professional success through understanding his unlikely destiny, which is the title of his book. Joe Pryor, welcome to the Mosaic Podcast. Thank you very much, brother. I appreciate being here today. Thank you so much for having me. It, it, there could be no greater treat, even if for no other reason that I just get to see your beautiful face and, and hear you talk to me for, for about an hour. Yeah, yeah, I miss you, brother. I miss you so much, but it's good to talk to you. I know. So before we get into your book, which, which like, first of all, right off the bat, he has a book called Unlikely Destiny. For those of you who think you're stuck in the world that you're stuck in, walk, leave the podcast right now, press pause, go to amazon.com and get Unlikely Destiny by Joe Pryor, part one. Okay. Which it is a great book. It's a great book. It's a great book, and we are going to go into that. But before we do that, what I want to ask you is a few questions so that people get to know you a little bit. Yes, sir. Yes. When, when you were a kid, just like, you know, now you're, now you're this big, you know, humongous bodyguard guy, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, yes. But when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, literally a basketball player. I love basketball. I also wanted to be a teacher. Um, I wanted to be either a gym teacher or a coach. Everything that I did when I was a kid kind of went back to sports, but I always wanted to be a teacher in a sense. But, you know, basketball was my game. I still love it. I played it then and I love it now and I watch it now. Um, I don't play as much as I used to, but I love the game. So that was the main mindset when I was a kid. Basketball was my thing. And when you played, at what level did you play? Did you play schoolyard basketball? Did you play uh, semi-professional? Did you play college? Did you play, did you go to college? I don't even know like what those things are. Let's. Well, basically I, I played in middle school. I played in high school, Manuel Arts High School. I went to James A. Fauché on the west side of LA or South Central, as they say. I went to Manuel Arts High School, played in high school. But when I went to college, I wanted to go to Cal State LA. I didn't play basketball because at the time, I didn't have um, the money to pay for college, but I decided to go to college, so I had to get a job and work my way through college, but I still love the game, still love the game to this day. So pardon me if I'm stereotyping your area, but from what I understand, you grew up not in, in, in the most beautiful area of LA. You grew up in a tough part of LA. Oh, it's not a stereotype. It's, it's the reality that I lived. I grew up in Watson Compton, um, it's funny. Um, there was, there was this post on Facebook that people have been posting lately is, um, talking about how old they are. And one of the things I said was, I am the Watts riots old. Wow. Um, I was 60, I was, it was 1965. I was five years old. Um, I was living on 108th and Avalon. There was a army Navy store on the corner of where I lived at 108th and Avalon because the riots took place. Um, Literally, they set that state, looted the store, of course, and they set it on fire. So whatever they didn't take, um, burned. And that store burned for about three days. But for the first 24 hours, um, you know, back then, Army Navy stores had a lot of guns and a lot of yeah. ammo. So since the fire department didn't come put out the fire, the store burned, and we had to literally sleep on the floor because all the, all the rounds from the ammo that was in the store was shooting off all day and all night. Wow. That first 24 hours. So I grew up in, in a pretty, pretty rough place. Growing up in Watson Compton, Cobb and the Crips started in my backyard. As a kid, you grew up dealing with that. 
Um, I had some cousins that were involved in gangs, but I also had friends that were involved in gangs. But I always chose sports, so that kind of kept me away from it. Sports and education, so I went to school. Wow. And so to a world that doesn't understand that, I want you to just take a moment and like sit with that for a minute because there is like, I grew up in a white middle-class neighborhood, right? Where okay. I, didn't have, I didn't have to worry about guns going off or the, when they did a, re, when I came home from school, I saw a survey of what white boys going to high school thought about. And their biggest fear was that they would come home with a D on their report card. Wow. You know, and you that, put that, that yeah. you put that now against the, where, first of all, what you're talking about. And also now what kids worry about when they come home from school today, which is, will my school be shut up? Will I come home alive? What yes. will happen? Will there be global warming? Will there be nuclear bombs? You know, a huge change. So what, what allowed you, to get into sports and education when the neighborhood was getting into gangs? And how did you protect yourself? Because how did you stay out of a gang? Well, one of the things is, like I said, I had a couple of, a couple of cousins that were kind of involved in the gang. So that kind of gave me a pass in a sense because I wasn't involved. But when you were an athlete back then, this was in the 60s and in the 70s, you kind of got a pass when it came to people messing with you or bothering you. Um, I wasn't a great athlete, but everybody knew I played basketball. I played a little bit of football. Um, I was a skinny kid. Um, got picked on a few times, but even though I was a skinny kid, I wasn't afraid. I would fight. Yeah. So that was the thing. I would fight back. Yeah. Um, we, me and one of my really good friends, uh, his name is Stanley, we went to middle school together. And we remember one day these guys were harassing us, uh, leaving our junior high school, Poche Junior High School. And we decided one day we weren't going to take it anymore. So we turned around and got ready to fight. They didn't want to fight. Yeah. And after that, no one bothered us again. Fabulous. No one bothered us again. So it was beautiful. And so how has that carried over for you into current, into current, into the life that you chose to live, current life? Do you, are some of those philosophies still what you encounter or still what you talk about? I, you, you kind of have to live your life based on the experiences that you've that you've grown through. Yeah. That's always been my mindset. I grew through the Crips and the Bloods and I grew through Compton and Watt. Um, so growing through those periods in my life helped me to become the person I am today. And that mindset is, first of all, you don't give up. Second of all, you never give up. And third of all, if you decide to give up, you have to rethink that and don't give up. And I know that sounds kind of crazy, but it all boils down to not giving up. Totally. You can never stop living your life when you're alive. That's the bottom line. Huge message. Pause for a minute. People understand what he said. You can never give up. You never give up. You can never give up. And when you decide you want to give up, you don't give up. That's right. Right. I mean, like, imagine what life would look like for the majority of the world if they just heard those three sentences. Because most of the time, life beats us up a little bit. You had a lot of situations where life could have beaten you up. Oh, and, and it you, did. And it did. And it so did. where did you get the courage to find the strength to come up with that philosophy? You know, it's, it's, it's just, I've always been told I was an old soul. And I guess it's just something I inherited. It's in my DNA um, from my ancestors. Um, a lot of them I don't know. Um, I've been doing a lot of research lately on my family, but a lot of my ancestors I don't know, but it's always been in me just, just to always press forward, always move forward. Um, every experience I've been through in my life, whether it be good, bad, or otherwise, you know, I, I take the, you know, in my book, I, I use this term focus forward. I've always had that mindset to move forward in a positive way. So no matter what happens, no matter how things are, no matter where I am in my life, I always keep my mindset positive. Fabulous. So you grew up wanting to be a sports guy or a teacher. Yes. Did that ever happen? Did you ever become a teacher or a sports guy or, or um, did life take you a different direction? Coached basketball for a little bit, um, never became a teacher, um, but 
coach for a little bit and, and, and I loved it when I did it. And I eventually, um, now that I'm back in LA after being in New York for 25 years, I want to kind of get back to, you know, when time permits, get back into, if not physical coaching, life coaching. Fabulous. I was going to say you're a month or two too late. The Lakers could have used somebody like you. To... <laughs> <laughs> well, magic ran away. Magic ran away. So, you know, they got to regroup. They got to regroup <laughs> big time, big time. So how did it end up that you got into uh, being a bodyguard? Be, I don't know if that's the way you want you you'd call yourself, but, you know, being a security consultant, working with these high, high level people. How did that happen for you? It, you know, it, it's crazy. It's it's it all started. My my background is in law enforcement. I did uh, between the L.A. County Sheriff's Department and Inglewood Police Department. I did 22 years in law enforcement. Wow. So while I was doing that, I was doing security. I started uh, back in the 80s um, doing security for Lionel Richie. Lionel Richie was the first person that I worked with. Um, and I worked through another company with Lionel Richie. I wasn't his main person. Um, but that, that world kind of was introduced to me back in 1983. Um, and I had been on the department a couple of years, Sheriff's Department a couple of years. After Lionel, I worked with Tina Marie. Um, Tina Marie was my first one-on-one -on -one client. I worked with her for three years. But time out. So you, yep. here you are, you're a policeman, you're, you're, and you're a public servant of the, of the city of LA, right? Yes. How, how, what is the connection that happens that takes somebody that's on the police force for two years and says, we want you to work security for Lionel Richie? How did, well, that, how did that develop? I, 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 again, um, one of the things I say in, in my book is from opportunity comes unlimited success. Opportunities present themselves every day. We have an opportunity or a chance to act on them. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. I was working one day, a trade, uh, that's what we call it when I work nights. I always like working nights because the bad guys are out at night. So I like taking people to jail. So I work nights. One of my really good friends worked the day shift. He said, hey, switch, switch shifts with me. I need to do something tonight. I said, okay, fine. So we switch shifts. I'm out. I'm sitting on Sunset in the parking lot. And there used to be a Tower Records on Sunset. Right across from Tower Records was Spago's restaurant. So... I'm sitting in the parking lot. I'm a, a gray Mercedes goes flying by me. It's early in the morning. There's really nobody out, but I give chase, pull the car over. It's Lionel Richie. <laughs> now, I admired him. I love his music. I love what he did. I love as, as a writer. I love what he did as a writer. I pull him over. He's on his way. He's leaving the studio. He was at Ocean Way Studios on Sunset. He's heading back home to Bel Air. I say, look, Mr. Richie, do me a favor. I know it's early in the morning. There's nobody out here, but just slow down. I stop him, warn and advise him, let him go. About two weeks later, a friend of mine calls me. While I, while I, let me go back to this. While Lionel and I were talking, he said, hey, look, have you ever thought about doing private security or work doing personal security? I'm like, no, not something I'm interested in. Two weeks later, a good friend of mine called me and said, hey, look, I have a good friend who's an LAPD cop. He had a security company and he's looking for people to work at Lionel Richie's house. So it was in a two week period, I get introduced to Lionel Richie two times. So I'm like, okay, maybe I should take a look at this. <laughs> I give this guy a call two weeks after that, I'm working at Lionel Richie's house. And wow. I wound up working with him for about seven years, mostly at his house. Cause I really wasn't allowed to do security back then. Yeah. So one of the things that I always say through the mosaic is the beauty of the image of a mosaic is it's lots of pieces that connect to each other. Yes. And that, and that like, you're, like you're saying now, it seems like we are one piece away from a whole new reality. Every so that, day. that and, and every single day there's an opportunity if we don't surround ourselves just with the pieces we know, but we allow those pieces to open up doors for us. And exactly. I, lo I love that's what you did. So from there... Now you're working, you're working security and you're working for the police department and there's no, yeah. and that's okay. They're okay. Everybody's okay with that. And yeah, then never got, never, I, they weren't okay with it. I just never got caught. I got you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you're, so you were doing it though. You were working your police shift hours and you were working security hours. They weren't over. Yeah. Right. No, no, okay. not at all. And so were you the size that you are now when you were doing that? Or were you, how, what, what size were you then? I was, 
I wasn't as big as I am now, but I started lifting weights. Um, once I got out of the academy for the sheriff's department, once I got out of the sheriff's academy, I was working in the county jail and they had a gym in the county jail. I've always loved lifting weights. I've always been interested in it. Interested in it. One of the, I met a couple of guys that worked in the jail that were power lifters. I'm one of those guys. I always wanted to be strong. So I started power lifting with these guys. And the base of power lifting is squ- uh, squats, bench, and deadlift. Yeah. So if you want to put on size, those are the main three exercises you do. I started doing squats, bench, and deadlift. And I did that for, oh, man, about 11 years. But I started doing it with these guys that I worked with in the jail before I went to patrol. So when I got out of the academy, I was about 205 pounds at six foot four. So I was really skinny. Yeah, strong. I put on about 25 pounds while I was working in the jail for that first 18 months. I got out of the jail in about 18 months. When I say got out, I went from working in the jail to working in patrol. I wasn't an inmate. Right, right. I got you. (laughs) So and then I put on about a good 20, 25 pounds in about a year and a half. Cause I was powerlifting. Yeah. And then after that, I just stuck with the lifting cause I enjoyed it. It was a way that I could release negative energy from my system after working in the job I was working. Cause yeah. being, being, being out there and working the streets and dealing with the stuff you deal with. Um, I don't drink, I don't smoke. So my outlet was going to the gym and working out. Yeah. It's completely understandable. When I was at Hay House, yeah. which, was, which was when we met, yeah. Uh, we we also were pub- we were also about to publish a guy who I think you might know by the name of Flex Wheeler. Yep. I mean, and, Flex yeah, he and, and goes gym all the time. Yeah. And he, so he was he was going to the gym, Gold's gym in Venice Beach. And he yep. and I and I joined Gold's gym to to sort of see him there and mess around with him. And I said, you know, I'd like I've been lifting. I'd I'd like you to train me. And he said, you know. I don't, I don't think you're like, I can't be seen even seen with you. You're going to embarrass me. But, <laughs> but, and that was when he got me to the place where I was bench pressing 345 pounds. Yes. So, so for me, that was a lot of weight that I was moving. And he still, and he said, I got to drop you. You're like, if people see me with you, it's an embarrassment. So, <laughs> but, but he was always laughing. Um, so you went from that and you built yourself up to a place where you were now big i mean you're when i met you you were a big guy you were a strong guy no one's gonna mess yeah. with you and so how do you go from lionel richie you went to lisa marie you were saying and how did that happen yeah, I had tina marie i had lionel richie then i had tina marie tina marie and while i was working with tina um we went to london and paris to do a couple of we did a week in london and a week in paris when i got back from there um i received a phone call from a really good friend who said that she needed somebody. Um, she had a client that was um, starting a new show, happened to be Montel Williams. He was starting a show in LA. She wanted somebody to work with him and not to do security for him. She just wanted me to work out with him because he wanted to might work out with him. Um, I said, I don't have time because I was literally just coming back from London and Paris with Tina. We were setting up a summer tour. So when we got back, when we were in London, when we were in Paris, when we were in Paris, Tina got sick. She got really sick, and we didn't understand why. When we got back to California, we found out she was pregnant. Wow. So that canceled the summer tour, and that gave me the opportunity to work with Montel Williams. And I went from training Montel to, to doing security for his show to becoming his personal security. Yeah, well, and you were really his personal friend. I mean, he... Yeah, oh, absolutely. So, right. It was, it was beautiful. So, and that's really where your, your path and mine first crossed. Yes. Uh, and it was, you know, I knew one thing that there were some people in that audience sometimes, not when I was there most of the time, because I was there with Sylvia, but there were some people in that audience that I bet he was happy to have you there with him. Oh, absolutely. Some of the people in the audience and some of the guests, because so, it was very confrontational back in the nineties. So, yes. Yeah. So, if you were to talk to someone who grew up in a situation, not it doesn't have to be Compton and Watts, but if you were to talk to someone in a situ, who grew up in a situation that was less than perfect, and that can be in the highest, most elite family or in the lowest, poorest family, because yeah. people feel victim no matter what their place is. What would be something you would say from the way you grew up 
that you didn't let you that never allowed you to become a victim of that situation what would you tell the people what would be one thing you would tell them well i don't know if there's one thing but i would probably tell them i would probably say this too shall pass because when you're in when you're in the thick of something you think that's your life yeah. You think that is the end to end all things that are going on with you. You don't realize that when you wake up the next day, that problem may have already gone away or yeah. an hour after that situation occurred, you're okay. It's like, I, I remember people saying, you know, would get, would freak out. I almost got hit by a car. Yeah, but you didn't. Right. So if it, if it didn't happen, it didn't happen. And, and, and when I say that, that came from that, if it didn't happen, it didn't happen, came from, we were serving a warrant one time and, and the commissioner serving a warrant, it was a knock and notice, early morning warrant. We did the knock and notice, we, we served the warrant. And then what wound up happening was we found a couple of traps that were laid in the house um, for people that were coming in to probably try and steal from the people that were in there selling drugs. So when you look at, when I looked at it after the fact, I went through two weeks of like nightmares, night terrors, waking up thinking something bad happened. And then one day this voice literally said to me, if it didn't happen, it didn't happen. Wow. So going back, going back to what the question that you asked, when you look at your life and you look at a circumstance or a situation that you're in, that's all it is. It's one situation. It's not the end all to end everything in your life. Yeah. I love that. It, it, again, I just want to draw the comparison to one of the characters in my book is called the road worker. And the road yeah. worker, his job is to fix potholes. And he says every road, no matter how beautiful or, or how old, one day over time will develop pothole. And he, for him, it's easy. He just carves it out. He then, you know, cleans it up, then he puts concrete into it, repaints it, and, and the pothole's gone. But, yeah. what, but what interests him most of all is the way people deal with a pothole. And he said there's four types of ways. Some people see it from far away and drive around it and never have to encounter it. Right. Some people drive into it and damage their car, take it to shop, get it fixed. And they're a little bit, you know, out of money, but, and a little inconvenient, but basically things are back to normal. Yes. Other people drive into the pothole, never acknowledge that their car's a mess, deny it to anybody who sees it and just keep driving it, hoping no one will notice their car's a mess. And a lot of people are like that. But he said, the one that interests him the most is the people that drive into the pothole and forget that it's just a pothole. And they, yeah. get stuck, they get stuck there and they start to believe that's their life. Yeah. And they yeah. forget that two inches out on the other side is a, is a long, glorious road to the life that's waiting for them. And they forget exactly. that two inches behind them is a glorious life that they lived or a life that's ready to go behind them. And they get stuck in the pothole. And yeah. so I, I love what you're saying because so many times things happen or don't even happen. But the story we make up from them is they could have happened. And here I am. And, what, like, and, and we get lost in like what would have happened if it would have happened. And how do I prepare for what would happen when it never even happened? Exactly. exactly. The fear you develop from something that didn't happen becomes real. Wow. And, and that's, that's the scary thing about reality. The fear that develops for, for, for something that did not happen. You know, there's many times I could have, you know, had things happen to me when I was at school, on the way home. But if it didn't happen, I can't live in that, in that space. Yeah. I can't live in that fear. So I, I, I learned early on, just keep moving. Focus forward. Keep moving. I love that. So let's go towards present now. Because you're, what you say is so intoxicating that I want to make sure that we get time to talk about your book and the work that you're doing now with people. Because, Thank you. Thank you. because. Hello. Yeah, no, I'm here. I'm just, I'm pausing. I'm trying to listen to, to something happening inside me because <laughs> like what, what I want to ask you before we get there is that here you are, you're this big guy. 
you know, and most people would look and say, if I look like this and I was as strong as he is, I wouldn't worry about much because I know I can handle myself and you can handle yourself and you can take care of stuff. But something that I just want to circle back to, which was that house that you came into that was wired to explode or I'm, I lost you, Joe. Joe? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, no yes, worries. I'm sorry. No worries, no worries. So that was wired to, to, to trap these people that came in to steal something. And you spent two weeks going through no, nightmares of feeling, of feeling like what could have happened. And here you are, this big guy. What, most people aren't that big. Most people don't have the ability to defend themselves like you do. What would yes. you say to people? How do, how, do we get, how do we put those things behind us? Because it sounds easy. Like, don't let them bother you. Put them behind you. Don't, it never happened. So just keep moving forward. But like the how to that is not uh, that simple. I mean, it's simple, but it's not easy. How, how do you advise people to do that? I, 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 most of my life, most of my adult life being in law enforcement, I dealt with life and death. When you deal with life and death and you start looking at some of the smaller things that happen in your life, if it's not a life or death situation, if it's not putting you in imminent danger, then what winds up happening is you realize that I can survive this. Am I gonna die from this? No. Am I gonna be upset? Yes. Am I gonna be angry? Yes. Am I gonna be sad? Yes. Am I gonna be emotional? Yes. But you can recover from all those. You can't recover from death. Once you're dead, you're dead. And I know it sounds kind of harsh, but I, I put things there in order to bring myself back to where I am. Yeah. If you're alive, you can still function. If you can still function, that means you can still reason. If you can still reason, that means you can still work through things to make your life better. But you have to understand that because of the fear that we face, and a lot of times we develop because of what we're thinking or what we're going through, that fear is what keeps us from moving forward. You yeah. have to learn how to control the fear. And so where does fear live? Fear is inside us. But, in, and, and, and you know, you, know you, you heard the term flight or fear, right? Yep. Um, being in law enforcement, being someone's personal security, I've had situations where I've been afraid but I didn't allow fear to stop me from doing my job. I have friends that are firefighters. I have friends that are paramedics. I have friends that do the same job I do. They, they did the bodyguard thing. They did the law enforcement thing. You get afraid, but you don't allow fear to become your, 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 your you, don't allow, you don't allow fear to become your friend because if it becomes your friend, then you accept it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I want people to listening to just like allow this to seep into you because fear is the number one enemy of anything that we do. Oh yeah. It, it blocks us from having, from being able to live our lives. And, and so as a bodyguard who dealt with fear and walked through it, one of my characters is a bodyguard in the book. And I say to people, yes. once you've met him, he's available to you. You can call him at any point in time. You can, you can invite him to, to hold up, to protect you so you don't have to put these walls around yourself to protect yourself. Because we don't need to be protected all the time. We only need to be protected when we're protected. Yes. So how would they call not, I don't want them to call you to take care of them physically, Joe Pryor, to call you. <laughs> but if you were that B, if you were that, that sort of archetype of the bodyguard, what would you say to people that when they need the bodyguard, how could they call the bodyguard to protect them? Basically, if fear lives inside you, on the other side of fear, is strength. On the other side of strength is courage. If it's there, you can call on it. The difference between, you know, they say the difference between a hero and a coward is what they do when it matters or when things are happening. 
I can be afraid, you can be afraid, but you don't have to give in to the fear. You can look for the courage. You can look beyond the circumstance that's happening right now. And again, you have to put it in perspective. If it's happening right now, are you in imminent danger of dying? And that's where I go with it all the time. If you're not in imminent danger of dying, dying if it's just something that maybe you might get hurt, you might get injured, you can recover from all that. But you have to deal with what's going on in your head in order to move forward from what's, what fear is causing. So, so we've determined now the situation, fortunately in this situation is one where I'm not gonna die. I could yes. get hurt, I could get injured. What do I call on? Do I call on strength first or do I call on courage first? You know, the, the, the most important thing to call on when something really bad is happening or you're going through a stressful situation is calm. Calm. You know how you say you take a deep breath? Yeah. Do it once, do it twice, do it three times? Yeah. You call on calm. Once you can get your brain to slow down, to get your heart to slow down, to get your mind to stop thinking about what if, then you can say, okay, I'm not dead. I'm still alive. I can move forward. How do I get out of this situation? How do I pull myself up? If it's something physical, then you use your physical body to do it. If it's something mental, then you take that mental aspect of what you're going through and you look to the other side of the negative of that mental aspect. You look to the courage. You look to the strength. You look to the power. That's what you have to do. I, I love this. What a, what a powerful insight for a world at large because most of the time we're, we're not in imminent danger at all. Exactly. Most of the time we're just scared. We're just scared of trying something new. And if you could take these principles that Joe's talking about now, and Joe, is this what you write about in your book, Unlikely Destiny? Or is, or, or, oh, absolutely. Yes. So it, let's it, talk it, about it. Unlikely Destiny a little bit and tell me how you started to write that and what's the reason for it. Because I want people to get, like, they can, they can be a fly on the wall in this conversation. Hold on for one second. Yeah, okay. totally, totally. Dad, I'm on the phone, okay? I went through several different um, areas of what Unlikely Destiny became. Um, it started out as focus. And focus was from opportunity comes unlimited success. It was an acronym. Right. It started out that way. And it evolved into Unlikely Destiny. And that's just how I looked at my life. Me sitting down to write a book was the most unlikely thing I could have thought about doing. But I had to look at the situation I was in. I worked with one of the best motivational speakers that I had ever met, and that was Montel Williams. Yeah. So I worked with Montel for 22 years straight. And working with him, I learned not only to be a positive person, but all the knowledge I acquired from every speaking engagement he did, to every event he spoke at, to every commencement speech, everything he had done, I was there. That was knowledge I was acquiring. Totally. And if I didn't use that to benefit, to help others, then shame on me. Yeah. And that's where Unlikely Destiny came from. And so to those people who are out there who are thinking, I wanna write a book, but I'm scared to death to do it. How did you get from being, like you're a guy that grew up in Compton and Watts. Yes. You're, you're a guy who wanted to be an athlete. You're a guy who became a policeman. You're a guy who went into, into security. Those are not normally the preambles of how you sit down to write a book. How did you get the courage then not to face your life because it wasn't life threatening, but to sit down and put your demons in front of on those pages to write the stories that you had to write to come out and write the book that you wrote. That was extremely hard. It was, it was a hard thing to do. It started out as me just writing notes about things that had happened in my life. And then those notes developed into two chapters and those two chapters developed into 10 chapters. And when I, when I sat down to really look at what I was doing, I'm like, I, I didn't know what I, 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 would, I had been writing screenplays. I had been writing, you know, stage plays. I had been writing, you know, um, think pilots for TV shows. I wanted to get into that aspect of television 
because I had been around it for almost 30 years. Yeah. So I wanted to do something in television. But then when I started working on this project of Unlikely Destiny and I started writing the book, I realized that this is what I want to do. I've had 20 plus years of training working with Montel Williams. I basically, he was my mentor. While, while working with him, I had met other people who had done, were doing the same thing he was doing. They were positive, they were focused, they were motivated. So when I sat down to really start looking at my life and putting it on paper, it was, it was getting it out of my spirit so that I could get it out to the world. But it was also therapeutic for me to help me move forward in my life. Yeah, because I, I think there's so many people that would say, like, give me an, give me an opponent that I can fight. Like us guys, we can say, you put somebody in front of me that I can fight. I, I'm not scared of that battle. Exactly. But the battle of our own mind and the thoughts and the demons that exist that say, I'm not good enough, or I'm not enough, or I can't do this, or the sabotage mechanisms that we put in our front of ourselves, we can't grab those and fight them. Or can we? We can. Um, I talk about this in the book. I say every, every thought you have is going to be followed by a negative. And unfortunately, most people will listen to that negative. They'll take that negative and they'll run with it again. There's that fear. So if they have an idea to write a book, they have an idea to do something outside of what they're doing for a living, they take that fear and that fear conquers them and does not allow them to move forward in that area. Now, when I first started writing the book, I was afraid of, first of all, if I wrote the book, will I be able to get it published? If I got it published, who was going to read it? And I've been surprised every step of the way because once you take a step, this is something I talk about in the book, once you take that first step forward, everybody you meet on that journey was put in front of you for a reason. And they're there to help you. I had people that I met 20, 25, 30 years ago that helped me get my book published. I love Montel that. wrote my forward for me. You know, um, he read the book and he was blown away. He, he said to me, he said, I knew you had it in you, but I didn't know you had it in you. Right. And when he said that, I understood it as you could write a book, but I didn't think you would do it. Yeah. Yeah. And so handed down from Montel to Joe, Joe now looking you in the eye or, listen, or speaking to your ear for those of us who aren't on video. Speaking to your ear, I want the lineage of that statement. I want you to say it again. And I want the lineage of that statement to hand down from generation to generation to generation. That I knew you could do it, but I didn't know you could do it. Yeah. And, and I want you to, I want people here to be a fly on the wall and get the inspiration Joe got. Not from Montel saying that, but from the spirit inside him that said, I have to do it, I'm going to do it, and this is something I can do and I will. It's, it's, it's the knowledge you receive. We get knowledge every day. We meet people every day. I try to make it a point when I meet people to take something from them. And when I say take from them, I listen, because that's what I am, I'm a listener. And I take what they give me and I use it to live a better life. Wow. And that just means I, I walk up to somebody. Um, I have this habit of I'll ask somebody, how are you doing today? And they answer me and I look at them when they answer me. Yeah. When your kid come home from school and you ask your child, hey, how was your day today? And if you don't pay attention to what they're saying, you're not going to really get what they're doing. So yeah. when, when Montel said to me, I knew you could do it. He knew I could do it, but I had to get rid of the fear that was in me to do it yeah. or not do it. And it's so, so does unlikely destiny help people get rid of the fear that is in them to not do the things that they know how to do? Is that what yeah, it is? It, would open your, it opens your eyes to the possibility. Every day you wake up you have a possibility to do something better than you did yesterday. And if you really, really look at your life, 
and start believing in who you are and understanding that every day, if you wake up every day, you're here for a reason. You have a point and a purpose. It's probably been shown to you. It's probably been given to you. It's, you've probably been told point blank. This is why you're here. Most yeah. of us reject that sentiment because we don't think we are that person. We don't believe we have it in us to do something beyond getting up every day, going to a nine to five, coming home and doing it again. Yeah. But if something keeps coming to you, and I tell people this all the time, if something keeps coming to you, it's coming to you for a reason. And again, once you take that path and you take that step to move forward, the people you meet on that path have been placed before you to help you. So it almost sounds like there's a destiny to our lives that is in front of us that we have the choice to choose or not choose. So is that what you're saying? Is that, is that unlikely destiny? The un, like, what is unlikely destiny? Why did you call it that? You, you, one of the things I talk about in the book, and, and I, I keep saying this, you, you have free will. You have free will to do or don't. You have free will to succeed or fail, but that's all up to you. Now, the unlikely destiny is looking beyond your circumstance, where you are, where you grew up, who you're surrounded by, and living a life that's better for you. You're not living your life for your parents, you're not living your life for your children. You're living your life for you, but in the process of you living that better life, you're able to help everybody around you. Yeah, elevate You're able everybody. to help the people you meet, and they're able to help you. Totally. That's why you're here. Totally. So I don't know about you, but I meet a lot of people, and I ask them a lot of questions because I love listening as well. And some of the questions I ask people is, like, who are you? And 95% of the, of the time, I get an answer, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Like, I have no idea. And I'll continue and I'll ask them, what do you think you're here to do? And almost 95% of the time, people say to me, I don't know. I mean, I I'm just, yeah. I don't know. I'm just here. So for those people, like once you know what you're here to do, I can understand all this. But like to those people who have no idea who they are or what they're here to do, it's no wonder that they just continue doing the rat race that they're doing, going to the same job, doing the same thing, eating the same thing for lunch at the same restaurant, coming home in the same traffic, coming, dealing with their family in the same way they always yes. have. And there's no, until a certain point where you just say enough's enough, right? And you get tired yes. of that and they either divorce or, or get a gun and shoot somebody from a tower or whatever they do, right? Because exactly, it, it exactly. drives them crazy. And so I understand all that. What would you say to those people who don't know who they are and don't know what their purpose is? How do they find that? I would say, take a look at your life. Take a look at the life that you're living. Take a look to the people, take a look at the people around you. Um, there's a saying that, you know, we are, the, we are the, the sum total of the five people we spend the most time with. Right. If the people that you spend time with aren't doing anything with their lives, and if you're really a motivated person, sometimes you have to have those people around you that you consider your friends or that they say they're friends. You, sometimes you got to push them aside. I've, I've had to get rid of a few people in my life in order to move forward because they didn't understand what my mindset was, what I was doing. And that's fine. I don't have to be angry about it. I don't have to be angry with that person. But I know what I want to do. So if you figure out who you are by thinking about who you are, thinking about what your point, and your purpose is, thinking about, is this all there is to life? And if you come to the conclusion that it's not, then you need to start looking at making changes. Love it. So I, I keep getting this, this uh, nagging thought that keeps coming into my head that says for conscious people who already are part of your choir, they're going to go hallelujah and you got them. But so many people are so scared to change what they are than what they're doing because they don't want people, they don't want to know who they are. They protect them. Most of us protect ourselves in silos. We paint walls, we paint the walls that we build around ourselves to protect us with pain with how you, we want you to see us. Yes. How would you, and, and the beauty of the bodyguard in my story is he says, okay, 
I'm going to take down those walls for you and I will walk in front of you so you no longer have to have those walls. And pretty soon you'll see that there, the walls don't need to be there because I'm here. You can call me whenever you're scared, but you're not, you don't have to be scared. Most of life is benevolent and kind. But how do you, like, how, I want you to draw on the bodyguard. I want you to draw on that guy who walks in and protects people, who walks in because people who need protection are scared of something, right? For the most yes, part. They they, and so, and fear is the thing that you're annihilating in people. So how do you, as the bodyguard, take away the fear that actually causes you, causes them to have you? Do you, you understand what I'm asking you? I understand completely. And this is... This is one of the things I do with clients. When I first meet them, I have a conversation with them. And I've had people tell me, I've had clients tell me, no one's ever done this before. My first thing I'm going to say to them is, this is what I will do and this is what I will not do. And I ask them, do you have any fears? And if they have certain fears, I tell them, I'm here to help you with that. And when I say that, they might be afraid of, it's like, I, I, you know, I'm not going to say the person's name, but I, had a, I, have a, uh, I work with a good friend who does what, they do what I do. They have a high, high profile client. Their client is afraid of bees, not for any other reason. They're just afraid of bees. Totally. They're not allergic. They're just afraid. So I had to do an advance, which means going out and surveying an area before the person gets there to make sure there were no bees there. Um, but you as an, as an individual may think that's something silly, but the person that has that fear is not silly, silly to them. Yeah, totally. So the first thing I would tell the person to do is what are you afraid of? If there's fear inside you, what makes that fear happen? And then once I realize what that fear is, when I look at myself, they can look at themselves. I tell them to stop and take a second. And now if that fear is what's keeping you from living your life to the fullest, then we need to figure out a way to attack that fear. We need to figure out a way not only to attack it, but learn to live with it, but not be guided by it. Yeah. So it almost seems like you go back to rinse and start over again, which is, is it going to kill you? Exactly. It, if it doesn't kill you, I can understand you could be scared that it's going to hurt you and a bee sting might hurt you and it might swell up, but like, do you think we can get past that or whatever? And we're just using bees. And, but it sounds irrational, the fear of bees. But to a person who's scared of bees, it's not irrational at all. Exactly. Because our, our perceived fear is as real as, our, as any fear that's possible, right? Yes. You know, I, and I still, I, to this day, I, I deal with the, a fear that I have, but it's a, it's a reality. You know what scares me? Mm -mm. Crazy people. And oh. when I say that, because they are not afraid of anything. Yeah. When, I, when you look at me physically, six foot four, 270 pounds, in decent shape, most people are intimidated by that. I walk into a room and they're intimidated. It's something that, deal, it's something that goes on in their head. Yeah. A person that has a psychological problem, and when I say crazy, I mean psychological problem, they don't see me that way. They're not afraid of me. When I was yeah. a cop on duty, uniform on gun and badge dealing with people that had mental problems they weren't afraid of me i remember one time my partner and i we were we were we received a call um on this on santa monica and i can't remember what the side street was i was working in the city of west hollywood there was a guy sitting on a bus bus bench punching himself in the head from like he was hitting himself like mike tyson would hit somebody and we drove up and he was still hitting himself so my partner goes to jump out of the car. I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, I'm going over to stop him. I says, well, if he's not afraid to hit him, he's not going to be afraid to hit you. Yeah. That's a real fear. But yeah. I still had to go out and deal with that situation. My mom worked with psych patients at the county jail. Believe it or not, my mom and I worked at the county jail at the same time. Wow. One of the things that I learned to do with people that had mental problems is, I don't know why, they all like to smoke cigarettes. I kept cigarettes in my, in my war bag, as he said. I gave the guy, I said, hey, would you like a smoke? He said, yes, I would. I gave him a cigarette. We were able Calm to get down. him under control, put him in the car, drive him away. It was a fear when I first drove up, but I had to reassess what was going on and use the tools that were given to me 
in order to deal with that situation. That's all we can do in life is we have to reassess, use the tools that are given to us. And again, if it's not life or death, then you should be able to, and you can deal with it. Um, Joe, we're winding down. I love this conversation. I, I'm, it only saddens me that you're not closer to me in my life that I get to talk to you more often. So we're going to have to do this again. I love it. I love it. I, I want to close. I always close by asking uh, a few questions. And so I just want to get your perspective on it. I'm ready. Um, from your experience, if one of the, one of the hopes of the mosaic is that we'll speak to people whose voices don't get heard and that we'll be the vo we'll, we'll collectively have a voice together that gets heard through the work that we do, through movies that we make, through podcasts that we have, through things that we do. If you could talk to somebody and say one thing without anger to a world that would receive you without judgment, what would be the one thing you would want to say to this world that we live in now? Wow, that's a good one. I would say, simply hear my voice. Everything I do is through my words. Don't look at my color. Don't look at my physical stature. Don't look at my bald head. Hear my voice. Wow. Hear my words. And what I'm going to add to that, because I think it's what you're actually saying, is it's not only the words that you're saying, but there's a resonance to your voice and a vibration that comes through you. And I believe a lot of the times our words are just a camouflage to occupy the mind so that we can really be touched by the heart. And if you listen to this gentle giant that sits in front of you, <laughs> who can turn, who, who, who is a bad, who can be a bad um, mofo sometimes too. <laughs> he, he, knows how to, he knows how to handle himself. I've had but, my moments. <laughs> but there is such a beautiful power of the heart that resonates through you. And like, I appreciate that, brother. I, really I, would do. Say, I would say don't only hear his words. Hear the vibration that his words camouflage. So I want to ask you one final question with possibly a follow-up. And then I want you to give me information of how people can get in touch with you, which we'll do right after that. Um, when you look at the world we live in today, is this the world you always dreamed that you would give to your children and your children's children? Wow. Um, that's a tough one. That, that, and, and the only reason I say that is because we've come so far and not taken any steps. Yeah. And when, when I say that, I, I mean that with the sincerity of, there's a lot of progress in our society, but the mindset of a lot of people is stuck in the past or not, not evolving, not coming to fruition, not living beyond a circumstance that they are presently in. Yeah. It, it's amazing because to let, up until yesterday, I would ask this to thousands of people and everybody would say, absolutely not. And you and someone else that I spoke to yesterday said, well, look how far we've come. I mean, we used to tar and feather people, you know, and, and so we've yeah. progressed a lot. So in one way, this is the world, but there's so much turmoil and dissension that I, that I wish it could, could be without that. So how would you, in your words, because you said we've come so far, but we haven't taken any steps really, what would be the one thing that you would say to people if you're, if you feel like we've come so far and there's still a step to take, what would the journey of a thousand miles starts with one step? What would that yes. first step be for you? Speak to the person next to you. Listen to what they have to say. Love it. Montel had this, he has this, uh, this uh, saying, uh, speak without offending, listen without defending. Love it. That's how, that's how most conversations should start. Speak without offending, listen without, listen without defending. And I put that in the book, actually. Um, because if you can say something and the person you're speaking to allows himself to hear it wholeheartedly with an open mind, spirit, 
and body, because we have to you have our physical body there, then that helps you not only listen, but to be able to speak your mind too. Love it. And if people want to get in touch with you, which I am so highly going to recommend that they do, not necessarily, I mean, I'm sure you're available for, to take care of, of people, but it's not, I'm not talking about from a bodyguard perspective, but if they want to come to you for coaching or they want to come to you to find out about your book or they want to come to you to learn more about how to overcome their fear, how can they get in touch with you? What's the best way to do it? And how can they get your book also? I, would, I, I have um, unlikelydestiny.com, uh, which is mine. I also have Unlike, Unlikely Destiny books. Um, they can reach me that way. Um, but I would say, you know, if, if you get a chance, go to, go to Amazon, get a copy of the book, read it. If you like what you read, I would, you know, and I'm, I'm not trying to sell books. I'm trying to get people to understand that they have more of a point and purpose to being here than just taking up space. If you buy the book and you like what you've read, give it to somebody else and let them read it. Yeah. And I know you will like the book and I'm going to, I'm going to say to you, do yourself a favor. In the course of humanity, the 15 or 20 bucks that you're going to spend on the book in the course of your whole life is nothing for the, for what you'll gain from it. So I'm going to tell you right now, get off your butt, push a button, go to Amazon, buy Unlikely Destiny by Joe Pryor, and get in touch with him. This man is a gentle giant that can give you the, that will give you the opportunity to overcome some of the fears that will, that will allow you to come overcome some of the fears that you have that are keeping you from living. So Joe, I want to thank you for coming on to the show. Thank you uh, for having me. We got to do this again. We yeah, have to it, do this again. It would be my honor and I'm sure, and I, I absolutely will. I just want to close by saying in my book, I wrote about a, a bodyguard, but today I've had the honor to sit with a bodyguard. And the one thing that we all need in this world is to look at the things that we fear the most, to look at those places that keep us from living the life that we dream of because we're scared. And I want to just recount what Joe said, which is so valuable. If your fear isn't going to kill you, walk forward. Absolutely. If it's going to hurt you, you'll get over it. You'll find a way to get over it. And the people you have around you will help you get over it. So keep walking forward. Focus forward and don't allow the past to determine your future. And I wish for you all the unlikely destiny of truly knowing yourself. Joe, thank you for the gift that you've given the world through your writing, through your person, through the knowledge that you have, and through the beauty of who you are in this world. And again, thank you for having me and thank you for the mosaic. I, I, I appreciate it all. It, it's my honor and privilege. Thank you again. And we'll look forward to seeing you again, Joe. I hope you'll come back and be on the show again. Absolutely. I'll see you soon. Okay. Love you, brother. Love you too. Take care. Ciao.